uh, and we are good to go. So thank you for everyone for coming to our first online meeting of the Central Texas My Mythological uh, Society. My name is Philip Balke. Uh, I'm the president of the CTMS and we are here tonight and we welcome uh, Dr. Dennis Benjamin, MD. Uh, he is a research associate at the Botanic Research Institute of Texas in Fort Worth. In addition to nearly 100 professional publications, he has contributed to lay literature and mushroom magazines. He is the author of a landmark book on the health effects of mushrooms, mushroom poison and panaceas, and uh, published a collection of uh, mushroom foraging essays, musing of a mushroom hunter, a natural history of foraging. He is also a watercolorist focusing on uh, fungi and botanical art. And tonight he's gonna talk to us about the uh, art and science of uh, mycophagy. So uh, Dennis, if you'd like to kind of give yourself a little introduction and then go ahead and get started. Really appreciate you for doing this for us tonight. So can everybody hear me? Hello? Yeah, that way are you? I'm muted. Yeah, everybody's muted, so we don't have any yeah. uh, overlap of the audio, but uh, I think everybody can hear you just fine. Everybody was clapping and stuff, so. So I'm just trying to set up That's what I wanted to do. Give me one second. Okay. Um, so first, thanks for, for the opportunity. I was so hoping to visit you guys in, uh, in March this year. I had everything planned for the trip down to Central Texas, and then bad things happened. So. Then the thing <laughs> happened, yes. Um, <laughs> So this is an opportunity to talk about something that I am sure the majority of people are, are interested in and maybe the, the single thing that attracts most people initially uh, to, uh, to mycology and that's eating mushrooms. Now I have to tell you as a kid when I was growing up, uh, I was told that in polite company uh, you should always avoid discussing uh, two issues, actually three, politics, religion, and sex. Um, but it turns out that there's, a, there's another one that has to be added to that list, and that's food, nutrition, and diet. And the reason for that is that what we eat every day is about the only thing that we have personal control over. Which means that you better believe that what you're doing is correct. So nutrition and food is very close to religion. And people maintain incredibly strong beliefs about what is right and wrong. Um, I might challenge some of those this evening uh, without intentionally trying to alienate everybody. Um, but it can be an extraordinarily emotional subject. Now, just to back up for a second, if I look at the history, especially of amateur mycology in the last 50 to 100 years in the US, it was sort of the questions that novice microfiles uh, Asked. And early on, the question was, what is this organism? What is this mushroom called? And so the focus, probably from the turn of the century, almost to 2000s, was on taxonomy. What, what label can we put on this mushroom? And then it changed to, okay, now I can name it. Can I eat it? And that's probably the most common question that I see uh, posted on, uh, on you know, Facebook and, and, and other mushroom chat sites. Is it edible? Is it edible? Is it edible? And then in the last decade, the third question that, that now is being asked is, is it good for me? What is its medicinal value? Will it save my life? So I love this description of what a mushroom is. It's a food widely esteemed by adults and universally detested 
by children. And I'm reminded of the story when our kids, uh, on, uh, one son I think was about three or four years old, and I come back from a uh, mushroom hunt, and actually I think it was the first mushroom hunt that I found uh, Belitis edulis, and I was so excited. And I was cooking it on the stage. There was some of the dishes that I've cooked over the, year, <laughs> over the years, uh, shrimp stuffed morels, a mushroom pate with morels and uh, chanterelles, uh, there's some spring bolides. But these are the mushrooms on the, on the left hand lower part that I brought home when I was cooking. And this kid climbed up on the side of the stage, on the side of the stove, and said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, I'm cooking mushrooms. And his response was, yuck, slug slime. <laughs> and that's an extremely common uh, reaction of many children. Eventually, most of us uh, actually over overcome that. And, and you like the slippery nature of some of these, uh, some of these fungi. But for, for, for many, it is a, uh, a learned taste. Our second son fell in love with chanterelles, which was a challenge to uh, stop him from uh, taking everything off the plate. So what I want to explore with you today are really three major questions. The first is what makes a food edible? The second is what makes a food tasty? And the third is what makes a food nutritious? You would think that these are simple. I remember as a kid wondering, how did we learn to eat all these things? You know, who died in, in, in the quest to make sure that what we eat, in fact, was, was edible? So the first thing to consider is what determines edibility. And I know people have a very romantic idea about nature, but the idea that Mother Nature is benign in nurturing is romantic, but really unrealistic. This is that very anthropocentric attitude that everything out there was designed for us. And so I need, while the earth may be our country, but it's really only at our peril. And most plants and fungi have strategies to avoid being eaten, uh, unless it helps them to spread their seeds or, or spores. And the only, you know, the only group of fungi that in fact are intentionally designed uh, to be eaten are truffles. Uh, those are you know, designed to be dug up eaten uh, and then spread across the, the, the countryside. But the idea that other fungi uh, are there for, for our benefit, I think is a really unrealistic uh, and, and potentially dangerous uh, attitude uh, that, I, that I see constantly uh, uh, promoted on, on various sides. So what does the word edibility mean? It means that it won't kill you. It is not the same question, is it worth eating? Uh, there are dozens and dozens of mushrooms that are edible. They're just not worth eating. And I'll come back to that, uh, that question later in this presentation. So what determines edibility are really three major issues. The one is the culture, the society, the tradition, and the taboos that you grow up in. The second, <clears throat> which people completely underestimate, but is extremely important, is technology. And the third, which is a bad word these days, but we've been doing it for about 7,000 years, or maybe longer, is genetic engineering. So <clears throat> what used to be called selective breeding. I think it's obviously changed dramatically, and what we do Today, it doesn't resemble the kind of selective breeding that went on. On the other hand, it's absolutely critical to infect almost everything that we eat. 
And just to remind you that every single food that we eat contains toxins. Most of them are present in such small concentrations that we ignore them, but every now and again, they can have serious consequences. For example, potatoes contain glycol alkaloids, especially in the green skin. So if you expose uh, potatoes to either light or warm temperatures, and the skin becomes green, and the skin becomes green, which I've seen happen in supermarkets, uh, that surface is really toxic. And there have been some dramatic episodes of potato poisoning, for example, in British uh, boarding schools, where the kitchen decided uh, to serve kids uh, potatoes that had been in properly stored. Tomatoes, which are part of the nutshade family, contains uh, solanine, and that's especially true when the tomatoes are green. So you shouldn't overindulge in any of them. Uh, rhubarb leaves are really toxic because they contain oxalic acid, while the stalks are fine. So we've learned the difference between those two. Um, we all know the trouble with beans and other legumes. Um, but, but a lot of the gas producing is not, that's not the main issue. The main issue is that beans contain compounds that bind to the surface of cells and can block the absorption of, of uh, other nutritious compounds. And if you go back and look at old recipe books, they all tell you, boil beans for 10 minutes before you turn them down to a simmer and you know, cook them for the next three days. And the reason for that boiling temperature is to get rid of the lectins. Uh, we were not designed to steal milk from cattle uh, after we weaned, um, but we continue to do that uh, because our ability to process lactose uh, tends to decrease, except for certain populations. In fact, lactose tolerance is the abnormal state. Most of the world is lactose intolerant. Um, there's some very interesting biologic reasons why people who move north with white skins uh, became lactose tolerance. Uh, but that's not the normal state uh, of, uh, of lactose digestion. Uh, nutmeg uh, can be really toxic in high concentrations. So when you have uh, the nutmeg around Christmas time, the effects are still probably due to alcohol rather than the nutmeg. Uh, wheat has become a problem for more and more people. And the whole breakfast, probably cauliflower, broccoli, all contain uh, So there isn't a single food that doesn't have a toxin in it. We've learned how to live with, uh, with, you know, live with these situations. So a couple of examples of how we use technology to deal with it. For example, cassava, which is one of the, high, the, uh, the most important uh, carbohydrates uh, eaten around the world, just for many of the tapioca, um, is really toxic. And so it has to be peeled, washed, and rinsed. Uh, the, um, the amount of technology that goes into producing bread is absolutely amazing. Whoever came up with the idea of taking this little grass seed and turning it into something edible still sort of blows my mind. Had it be fresh, dried, had um, undergo grinding, drying, yeast, heat, baking, uh, before anything became edible. And I've mentioned the issue of uh, using technology for beans. Okay, how about culture? So the culture you grew up in will definitely determine what are the things that you regard as edible. So in Italy and France, eating horse meat is in highly acceptable. Can you imagine anybody in Texas recommending the uh, consumption of horse meat? Um, insect eating is still widely practiced throughout the world. Countries like 
island uh, snails and frogs. In fact, snails may have been one of the first uh, agricultural products that was found. Um, they're very easy to keep. They don't run away, away. You don't have to build fences for them. They're highly nutritious, easy to keep. Uh, if you go to Peru, guinea pigs um, is, a, is the national fish. Uh, the taboo against pork for Muslims and Jews. And nobody in Korea and Vietnam has probably been there. So each culture has developed um, rules and customs on what they regard as a bird. So the left hand top is a uh, horse uh, butcher in, in Italy. Uh, it was interesting, horse, meat, horse eating uh, sort of followed all the wars in Europe. Um, horses were bred you know, as military vehicles, and when the wars were over, there were too many horses. And so eating the, uh, those horses became a much more after. That's a nice uh, curry, guinea pigs roasting in, in, in Peru, some water beetles in, in Thailand. It has a classic dish to it. Hey, Dennis. Yeah. Could you uh, speak into the microphone a little bit more? Some people are saying they're having a little uh, hard time hearing you, but. Okay, I'm gonna get a little closer to the microphone. To yeah, that's, the that's much better. If you could do that, that's great. Okay. Um, so, we've, so we've mentioned uh, technology uh, and culture, but the third and probably most important aspect of what's made our food edible has been genetic modification. Because everything that we eat today, except perhaps wild mushrooms, have un has undergone major genetic modification. So we've bred lima beans um, in order to decrease toxicity because the ancient lima beans contained large amounts of, uh, of a cyanide compound. Now, some people still don't think that lima beans are edible, but uh, at least they're no longer toxic. Uh, tomatoes have been bred to allow for uh, easy transportation for their pretty red color, and unfortunately have been bred, uh, not intentionally, but the flavor has been eliminated. Uh, many of you have probably read uh, Michael Pollan's book, uh, where he describes how Apples were bred really to satisfy our sweet tooth. And every year, the sweet, the, the amount of sugar in apples increases with the new varieties. And every domesticated poultry um, uh, product and animals have been genetically modified. So here's just an example. Top left is what we think may be the original corn. It's a grass known as Tiacinto. Although there's still a lot of discussion about where corn, what, what we recognize as corn today does not exist anywhere in the wild. It has been genetically changed by selective breeding over about 5,000 years in New Zealand. This poor Indian jungle fowl, which really is pretty, has been bred into this monstrosity that we eat today that really just consists of two huge breasts. And then on the left is what the original tomatoes were, which were these small little, almost inedible, hard uh, berries, uh, and bear no resemblance to, you know, the big boy or uh, all of the, uh, the tomatoes that, that we recognize today. So everything has been changed over time. Well, the good news is that we are omnivores. Uh, like pigs, we can survive and thrive on many, many different foods. And we continue to adapt to these new foods, but slowly. And our physical evolution is much slower than our social evolution. And it's important to recall that agriculture, as we know today, is you know, somewhere between eight and 10,000 years old. And modern food production 
is less than 100 years. And I would bet that the majority of what you folks are eating did not exist at the time you were born, 50 uh, years ago or less. So we have dramatically uh, changed our food supply in an extraordinarily short period of time. So <laughs> it's hard to say anything about some of the dietary fads and trends. Uh, but we have no idea what the Paleolithic diet and lifestyle is. Now I'm going to give you a little different classification of foods uh, so that you see where, uh, what, where they came from uh, and, and why some of them are more nutritious than others. By far and away the most nutritious are embryos, the unborn. Um, and the reason these are so nutritious is they contain all the ingredients required for the production of a new individual. So eggs and caviar, all grains, fruits and nuts are embryos. We eat energy storage systems, root vegetables, tubers. Some of our most favorite foods are partially rotten, or what I call called controlled rot. These are our fermented foods. Bread, beer, wine, cheese, sauerkraut, on and on and on. Without these, uh, probably life would hardly be worth living. Uh, and then we eat muscle and offal. And the final thing that we eat are sex organs. And those two are the mushrooms and calf fries. So now let's look at those mushrooms and try and answer the question, how do we know if a mushroom is safe to eat? If it is safe? A lot of it comes from ethnomycology and looking at what various people have uh, eaten over the years. But no, no scientific studies have ever been conducted uh, to validate many of the claims that you find in uh, F the ethnomycological literature. So mushroom edibility is extremely poorly studied and it's even worse to be documented. There's a huge amount of what I call cut and paste plagiarism. So from one field guide to the next, people do nothing more than uh, cut and paste from what they've read uh, from another field guide. And yet the field guides is, uh, uh, is the one source that most of us go to to try and find out if, uh, if mushrooms are edible. Obviously in the last uh, couple of decades, everyone goes to the internet and there was another, another interesting uh, four poisonings in Oregon this week from uh, a family that tried to identify uh, mushrooms from an internet app. Now, having said that, there's no difference between an internet app and a field guide. Each one can be as bad as the other one. And then probably most important is <clears throat> we find out from family and friends. And this is sort of basic folk wisdom that your family take you out in the room they teach you what's edible, and that tradition is passed on from generation to generation. And that's probably one of the most successful ways that people learn about safe mushrooms. The downfall occurs is when you're in a different habitat. So as long as you don't move more than you know, 100 miles from home, folk wisdom is fine. But if, <clears throat> if, if the weather pattern changes, or you move, mushroom edibility uh, can change very dramatically. So here's one of the earliest uh, mushroom edibility charts. But then starting in the 15th and 16th centuries,
people started to codify uh, plants in these magnificent books called herbals. Uh, so these books were some of the first botanical illustrations of what plants were, which ones were medicinal, which were edible, and which were toxic. And these sort of were the Bibles for um, at least mushroom edibility. Now, one of the most interesting ones, and if you get a chance, this is definitely worth reading, is Charles, Charles McElvain's book uh, called 1000 American uh, Fungi. It's delightful. His description of the fungi and his experiments with edibility uh, are amazing. Um, I have to warn you, this guy had a iron constitution. He ate stuff that we know is certified and toxic. And in it, he also describes mushrooms that he thought were toxic that we now regard as completely edible. Um, but if you can get a copy of this book, it is really entertaining and, and, and educational. So the issue with mushroom edibility is for some reason, we regard it differently from all other foods. Uh, and there's a simple duality. Uh, we label them either as edible or poisonous. And we seem to have forgotten what Paracelsus said in the 19th century, that the only difference between medicinal food and poison is the dose. So in many of our so-called edible, edible mushrooms, it's easy to identify toxic molecules the same way that I illustrated earlier, there are toxic molecules in all the foods that we eat. That does not make them poisonous. All it does is says that there's a toxic molecule in it, and if you eat enough of it, you may get sick, but if you don't overindulge, you're gonna be fine. Now, when I started out in mycology, I got really frustrated. I remember that my first visit uh, to a mushroom show in Seattle, and everything was labeled as <clears throat> edible or toxic. And then there was a group of fungi that said edible with caution. And I thought, what on earth does that mean? How can you be cautious about something that you're going to eat? And I've subsequently come to the conclusion that that should be the label that's put on every single mushroom that we see. Because edibility depends on so many other factors than uh, merely the uh, identification and location I'm going to come back to. Because it depends on the species and the species in the USA may not be the same. They're certainly not the same as those in Europe where a lot of uh, edibility was uh, first established. And they're not even the same across the US. And a good example of that is gyromitra. Uh, gyromitra in the Midwest, gyromitra esculenta, is certifiably toxic. Everybody who eats it inappropriately without preparing it correctly is gonna get sick, whereas on the west slopes of the Rocky, of the Rocky Mountains, the incidence of poisoning to the gyromite is almost non-existent. It's, it has been described that it's much, uh, much less common. And we don't know if that's because of different habitats or in fact, um, if it's because the species that are growing there, even though they look similar, are different. And there are currently some ongoing studies looking at the difference of uh, gyromitra across the US. But at this point, what's absolutely surprising to me, it has never been formally studied. Habitat and substrate make a huge difference. So chicken in the woods, for example, on the West Coast, um, was very seldom eaten uh, because there were a number of toxic reports, whereas on the East and the Midwest, uh, chicken in the woods was a favorite mushroom. Same, same with honey mushrooms. The method of preparation. 
um, will change edibility considerably. And then most important is the one that, that is purely independent on the individual is your own personal physiology, your digestive system, your allergies, the enzymes you have, your GI tract, your microbiome, uh, each of those will change how each individual reacts to a specific uh, Now, just to give you an example, this is uh, sort of the, the uh, case study of morels and the false morel. Um, so they have Morcello and Jaramitra and Burpus. And we all agree that all of them are toxic if they're eaten raw. They are going to make a high proportion of people ill. On the other hand, if they well cook for cello and burpa, are fine. If you dry uh, gyromitra and then prepare it appropriately, it clearly is edible. Uh, and it's one of the most favorite mushrooms in Northern Europe, especially in Finland. Uh, but it has to be properly prepared. And the, the toxicity with morels is relatively mild. Uh, with gyromitra, it can be moderate and very, very fatal. Uh, and there's probably either very little or no toxicity associated with, uh, with burpa. And yet, if you look at field guides, you'll see that morels are prized, gyrometra is labeled as poisonous, and burpa you call it uh, to eat with caution. So to come back to the statement that edible does not mean that it's worth eating. Now, I did a study a couple of years ago where we sent out surveys to about 500 people across the US asking about their experience about mushroom eating. And most of them follow a very similar trajectory. When they start out, they eat two or three or four species, you know, the sort of classics, uh, chanterelles, morels, polites, uh, maybe shaggy manes. And then everybody <laughs> goes into a state of experimentation. And I know that I got to a point that I had sampled something like 100 to 120 different, uh, different mushrooms. Uh, I remember being at an Anna foray and we were, I was sharing a cabin with a bunch of guys from North Carolina who arrived back in our cabin with basket loads of stuff. Uh, they divided the big cast iron pan into uh, sort of eight, eight uh, high shaped segments and sauteed mushrooms in each one. They had not identified a single one of those, but they wanted to try them all. Uh, none of them got sick, but I think the Jack Daniel probably helped them uh, uh, get through that evening anyway. <laughs> uh, but then after time, um, at, when I, when I compile the data of people's mushroom eating, that stage of experimentation finally gets back down to about four or five favorite mushrooms uh, that, uh, that truly are exceptional because of their taste or texture or, or other additives. So we all follow this, or not at all, but many people follow that trajectory. And I have to tell you, there is no limit to what people are willing to eat and taste. And culture, tradition, and family, um, and the, the food ways that you become accustomed to are really important as well as history and personal preference. I think one of the silliest questions that I ever get asked is, uh, what do you think is the best mushroom? And it's the one that I like the best. Uh, let me give you one other example, and this is the slippery jack. So Cerulus is edible for most people, but there is a moderate incidence of a cathartic effect of what I've termed prunes on steroids. A right? very sizable number of people who eat um, Cerulus, even when they peel it, uh, which de probably decreases the effect somewhat, uh, are going to have a cathartic effect. But if you look at the terms in guidebooks, these are some of the ones that I just took off my shelf. Slimy, insipid, nauseating, bland, useless, tasteless. And yet, it's widely eaten by Russians and Eastern Europeans. <clears throat> when I was hunting in 
origin in Washington, I love the fact that the Russians and Eastern Europeans were picking all of Suwilis, uh, leaving the Matsutake behind uh, for the Japanese and me. So the favored species really depends on uh, your local situation. It's very culturally dependent. So for Italians, <clears throat> any bolete is called a porcini. It's incredible. Um, well, we tend to limit it to boletus edulis later. Uh, almost every bolete is a porcini. Uh, white truffles and chanterelles. For fins, gyrometra, which are called lachelles, Chinese shiitake woods here, the French morel sets, uh, which are bolites, chanterelles. Black truffle. <clears throat> in Spain, one of the most favorite mushrooms, the milky caps. So, Lactarius deliciosus. You'll find piles of it in French markets. Um, our Lactarius deliciosus is clearly a different species, and we should probably drop the word deliciosus because it just is not delicious. Uh, in Mexico, there are many ammonitic species that are eaten, and in Africa, um, the tomatomyces, the mushrooms associated with uh, termite mounds, um, is uh, especially favorite. And here are just a couple of examples. Every time I travel, the one thing I will always do is go to the, ma the markets and see what the favorite mushrooms are. Uh, the picture on the left is in Las Ramblas in Barcelona, and there you see this large stack of uh, Lactarius deliciosus. Um, up in the left hand is Matsutake in a market in Japan. And here are all the different sizes and costs for porcini in, 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 uh, in Italy. Now you, you can tell which part of Italy you're in by the way they label their, their chanterelles in the in the uh, northern part of Italy, which sort of oscillated between being in Italy, Germany, and Austria, uh, they call Finfoli. Um, in Germany, they're Fifilin. Whereas in the south of Italy, they're called Galetti, or little chickens. Okay, let's get to some of the myths that most of us learned and probably still carry about uh, mushrooms. The first is, that mushrooms have very little nutrition. The second myth is that raw food is better for you than cooked food. And the idea being that nutrients are destroyed by heat or that they're lost in the water of steam. And the third myth is that mushrooms should never be washed. I'm sure you've all heard of each one of these. So let's break this, some of this down by understanding a little bit of basic fungal chemistry. As many of you know, fungi are much closer to animals than they are to plants. And the only reason they were studied in botany departments rather than zoology departments is they couldn't run away. But their cell walls do not resemble plants. They're composed of, of chitin or hemicellulose and complex polysaccharides. And their main source of energy store, unlike plants which store energy as starch, is like us, and it's stored as glycogen. And they have the basic structural proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and then contain many secondary compounds. And when you see any nutrition analysis, it's really important to understand that it's not based, none of these are based on human feeding studies, what can be actually absorbed, what we're able to utilize, uh, understand that the measurements are approximate and are usually generalized and are statistical measurements, not individual ones of an individual product. And there's a huge difference between chemical composition and bioavailability. So there are many factors that can influence the concentration of the nutrients. Uh, their differences in the strains, even of the same species, how they grow, the method of cultivation, the stage of life cycle, 
gets analyzed, proportion of mushroom used for analysis, the accuracy of measurement, and the time of analysis. And what we really would like to know is what, what's the bioavailability, what we actually absorb and utilize. And that depends on how the mushroom is prepared. Do you need it raw, cooked, salted, pickled, dried, reconstituted, fermented? It also depends on your personal genetics and <clears throat> any accompanying foods and their effects. So this is the issue with uh, fungi, the cell wall for chitin, which forms, it's the same compound that forms the exoskeleton of insects, in crustaceans, uh, and also contains lupins. Chitin for us is almost entirely indigestible. So if you don't cook the mushrooms, uh, and you can do this experiment very easily, eat a raw mushroom and watch the toilet for the next 24 hours, and you will see the intact mushroom uh, at least at, at some point. So the first myth that it's not uh, nutritional is that mushrooms contain more protein than beans, but less than meat, fish, or poultry. I think the reason that it was regarded as not nutritious is anywhere between 70 to 90% of the average mushroom is composed of water. It's important to understand this because when you wash the mushroom, it's already 90% water. When you go and forage them in the field, it's often been raining the day before. You can't squeeze any more water into mushrooms um, because it, it, it's, all, it's already, if, if you will, saturated uh, with the water. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, there's very little fat until you add the butter, cream, cheese, oil, and eggs. And on average, there's about 300 to 400 calories in every high, uh, 100 grams of dry weight, which means nothing to most people. So if you translate it, about a half a pound of mushroom has 80 calories, about the same as a single slice of bread. So they contain all the essential amino acids, uh, about 40 to 60% of the dry weight is carbohydrates, most of it glycogen and some usual sugars. There are water soluble vitamins, but obviously no fat soluble vitamins, such as A, E, and K, because uh, those uh, require fat. And vitamin D is present, especially if exposed to sunlight. And this is really interesting that fungi are one of the few organisms that can produce vitamin D when exposed to sunlight. Uh, this was discovered probably two decades ago. And so now many of the commercial mushroom uh, production plants are exposing uh, things like shiitake and uh, Agaricus bisporus to light for 10 to 15 minutes to increase their vitamin D content. Not that most of us need any more vitamin D, especially if we <laughs> excuse me, get adequate sunlight. Most minerals are present depending on the substrate and location, and there's very little to no iron in most. So up in the Northwest, I remember when this occurred, one of the local uh, mushroom production facilities uh, companies was Ostrom's. And they started driving their trucks around with uh, when they started increasing the amount of vitamin D. Uh, and this became sort of a, a bad trend. And it increased their sales by 100% uh, in about six to eight months uh, by advertising with their mushrooms. Uh, in Canada, in Canada. The carbohydrates, there's some interesting sugars. Uh, and some that a few people can't digest very well, such as triolose. 
And as far as the proteins are concerned, <coughs> about 70% of it is digestible, and it's almost as good as um, meat, fish, or poultry, certainly better than most vegetables. On the other hand, protein nutrition is not an issue in the USA. We probably consume two to five times more than we actually need. So <clears throat> none of us need to worry, fortunately, about the problem. And all the essential amino acids are there. So why do we eat mushrooms? I think there are you know, half a dozen uh, good legitimate reasons. One is the texture. Some have wonderful crunch like lobster mushroom. Um, I love matsutake, which are crisp and chewy. Uh, fresh porcini, soft and slippery. Sparasis, cauliflower mushroom, which is really crisp. And so mushrooms can add these incredible textures to our meat. Uh, we can <clears throat> eat them uh, for the aroma. And the two, I think, that are the most striking, obviously, truffles are number one, where the aroma is the most important aspect of uh, my coffee tea of truffles. And I think the second is matsutake. Once you have uh, smelled a matsutake, you will never forget it. They can be used as vehicles for other foods, uh, auricularia or the wood deer mushroom, which is easily found in many places in, in Texas. It's absolutely flavorless, but widely used, especially in Asian cuisine, because it will accept all the flavors of the sauces that you put with it and maintains its nice uh, crisp and, um, and crunchy texture. So it's used in dishes like hot and sour soup, mushy pork, uh, as well as others. It by itself is almost perfectly tasty. And then flavor. Um, and there are some that have unique flavors. The overwhelming majority uh, have very mild, earthy flavors without any unique aspects. Uh, morels, chanterelles, and the wheats, I think, are three that have fairly unique flavors. Then most of the rest just taste like what we regard as mushrooms or carrots. <coughs> Excuse me. Having said that, mushroom flavors are extremely dependent on species and location. Uh, for those of you who have been fortunate to eat a, an Italian porcini, a Bolivis edulis in Italy, it tastes nothing like any belief that I've ever eaten in the United States. Probably the closest is um, Bolivis rubriceps in the Rocky Mountains in, uh, in places like Colorado, about 10,000 feet. But our porcini, what we call porcini, tastes are a mere shadow of what, uh, what is eaten in Italy. Uh, I remember the first time I ate chanterelles that were being picked in the East. I'd, most of my origin was in Washington State. And we liked chanterelles, but I didn't think they were, were anything special. And then I was visiting my sister who at the time was living in Birmingham. And there were chanterelles in her backyard. And I ate them and I said, these are not the same as the chanterelles on the West Coast. And that's now been very, very well documented. Uh, probably the worst of all the chanterelles is the California chanterelle, also known as the mud pot. Why anybody eats that mushroom, other than the fact that it's a wild mushroom, I have no idea. You said it was called the mud puppy? Yeah, it's called the mud puppy because um, it, when it comes up, it's always covered. It barely breaks the surface of the, the soil and is covered in mud. And that may be the tastiest part of the entire mushroom. Interesting. So the season, the stage of growth, 
uh, will change the flavor. Um, most mushrooms go through a flavor profile. They're relatively, and, and that applies to most other fruits and vegetables. Um, probably the, the, the trickiest can be morels because their flavor profile increases dramatically until it decides to go rotten. And that can happen fairly rapidly. And it goes from something that's delicious to something that's really awful, um, you know, within, within a couple of days. Storage and preparation can change. If you look at old recipe books, <clears throat> many of them claim that mushrooms, uh, that morels have a smoky uh, flavor to them. And the reason for that is that most of them at that time were imported from Europe, especially in places like India, where they were dried over smoke fires. So if you like your morels dried over cow dung, uh, they certainly do have a smoky flavor. Um, but uh, otherwise, you know, dried conventionally, it really isn't. <clears throat> and storage will change over time. And we discovered this years ago that, uh, and this applies to mushrooms like dried porcini, uh, dried morels, that the longer you store them, the flavor becomes more intense. And we got to the point that we would not eat our morels for about five years. So we would label the, the, uh, the vintage and um, I've still got morels that I picked in uh, the Cascade Mountains in 1980. And they are by far the best morels uh, still in, in, in our country. And if they're properly uh, dried and stored, they can be uh, kept almost indefinitely. So the other factors that can influence flavor and taste are individual genetics. There's a huge variation in what each of us sense in terms of smell and taste, our background and upbringing, on the importance of fat. I think nothing, nothing good came from fat-free, uh, the fat-free cooking that went on in the uh, in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, because fat carries almost all the important flavor. Uh, salt and acid is <clears throat> really important in bringing out the flavors of many of the mushrooms and then synergies with other food. And then most important is the, what your expectation is and the setting that you're eating. So there are lots of misleading names and descriptions like oyster mushrooms were not named oysters because they taste like oysters, but just because of their color and shape. Lobster mushrooms do not taste like lobsters. I don't care how much you believe that you're eating seafood because they're like lead. Fried chicken mushrooms. Chicken is the words. Um, I think, <clears throat> I know people will swear blind <laughs> that it tastes like chicken, <laughs> but it certainly doesn't taste like any chicken I've ever eaten. And I have honey mushrooms, obviously were uh, named, <coughs> excuse me, for the color. I mentioned smoky morels. And the apricot perfume of chanterelles is true for the eastern chanterelles, but you will not get any apricot perfume uh, from many of the chanterelles uh, picked in the, in the West Coast. So it's really important uh, not to take any of these descriptions that you read in, in uh, field guides uh, too seriously. So mushroom flavors are dependent on a number of different things, but by far and away the most important is MSG. The reasons mushrooms have such a great flavor and are added to so many dishes is because of their high concentration of monosodium glutamate. You can either buy it in a powder form or you can eat it uh, as a mushroom. And many of the flavors are enhanced by the presence of fat, uh, butter, milk, 
extinction of cream. Uh, but it's really important to always save and use the water when we rehydrate any dried mushrooms. Now, a few words about cooking. And this is one book recommendation <coughs> that you should seriously consider. And it's written by the head of the uh, anthropology department at uh, Harvard University, Richard Wrangham, on how cooking made us human. Uh, it's a really important book because it, while it's not a new theory, it really fleshes out the importance of cooking in changing both our physiology uh, as well as our sociology. Because what cooking does is increase the caloric value of most foods by 50 to 100 percent. So we cook mushrooms because it breaks down the chitin and it makes the nutrients more available for absorption. It improves flavors. <coughs> it increases digestibility. And it eliminates volatile and heat labile toxins, carcinogens, and other mutagens. So it's really, really important to cook mushrooms. And when I say cook, I mean cook them well. I think for years and years, uh, I personally know that I undercook mushrooms. And now I do it to the point that they caramelize. And what that does is it enhances the reaction of the proteins called the Maillard reaction which is really responsible for the savory, uh, rich taste that we get, for example, in uh, meat that's cooked on a grill or that's uh, well sauteed. And the same goes true for car car caramelized mushrooms. Uh, there was a recent recipe that I thought looked ridiculous, but I tried it. Taking regular agaricus bisporus, giving it a a brine bar for 10 minutes then sticking it in a 450 to 500 degree oven with a little olive oil for 40 minutes. They, the mushrooms decreased in size, obviously, as all the water was evaporated away. And they almost turned into mushroom jerky. And they were the most delicious thing that I had eaten. <coughs> so with adequate cooking, you can really transform something uh, from average to exceptional. I was also introduced a number of years ago uh, to something that I'd never tried before, and that's grilling mushrooms. And that's now our standard method for fresh uh, morels and fresh porcini. And that's just slicing them in half, brushing them with butter, and grilling them, as you see in this uh, a center photograph. If any of you have looked at uh, the cooking with wild mushroom site on Facebook, you'll probably see that many people post recipes where they mix 20 different species. Um, I'm amazed that, that that's an enjoyable meal. Uh, this on the bottom left hand corner is a meal that we had in Italy. There's some polenta in the middle and six different species were all kept independently of seed because they all have very, very different tastes. Mixing species would be like having a stew in which you put a little beef, a little veal, a little pork, some fish, some chicken, uh, and some lobster and expected to keep all those flavors and textures separate. So there's very little reason to mix species into a single speaking, mix species into a single dish. It's much more enjoyable if you want uh, to, uh, to savor the individual taste to keep them separate. This right hand one is an interesting thing that we discovered by chance. We have been out the, <clears throat> the day before and picked some lobster mushrooms. Um, I sauteed them and then added fried eggs. And the whites of the fried eggs 
turn this incredible magenta color that you never get lobster mushrooms. <coughs> Fry up some eggs and see what you have, what color they turn. As far as storage, some dry extremely well. Porcini morels, black trumpets are spectacular fried. Shiitake and lobster. Uh, I know people do drive sham curls and not shiitake, um, but I've found that they do not really constitute very well. And uh, both their flavor and their texture is not nearly as good. <clears throat> the dry mushrooms can be turned into powder. It's a great way for using, to use, especially for chini, uh, in making sauces, uh, stews, soups, uh, or they can be mixed with salt. Cooked and frozen can be applied to most mushrooms. Uh, pickled, uh, which is no more than a really good excuse for having salt and vinegar, uh, so you can drink another vodka. Uh, you should not can mushrooms <clears throat> unless you're an expert. Or as cleaning, to feel clean with a, I just use a very cheap paintbrush to get rid of uh, you know, the basic dirt. But then they can be really washed well in water and scrubbed, either with a toothbrush. And then what I do is thin them dry, or towel them dry uh, in, in, a, in a salad spinner. Um, there's no reason to leave them soaking for any length of time. You can eat a small amount, and I mean a small amount of dry or raw mushrooms, um, mainly for the flavor and the texture. And the ones would be agaricus pisporus, which you find in the salad bar. Uh, <coughs> you're not going to get any nutrition from any of these. <coughs> in, <coughs> in Italy, Ammonitis cesarea. And I've never tried the, the Texas Ammonita Jacksonia. Maybe one of you have. Um, the Letus edulis is spectacular raw. This plate on the right hand side, there's some raw Belitus edulis that Eugenia, Eugenia Owen uh, made for us when we were sitting here in Colorado. And it was so delicious that I unfortunately ate half this plate. Um, and I really regretted it the next day. I was yeah. being able to figure out for it. Yeah, like a ceviche? Uh, just, just raw with a little uh, squeeze of uh, lemon juice and olive oil. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like a, a mushroom ceviche. That sounds good. Uh, Fristalina hepatica, uh, but never any morels or any false morels. So here are a couple of scenes from Italy. Um, this is Ammonitis cesarea being served raw with a little prosciutto, and here's uh, some raw uh, porcini uh, that, again, is served in very small amounts, small slices, it's fine. If you find a small button when you're out in the woods, taking a nibble of it, it has the sweetest, nuttiest taste. It's, it's really worthwhile if you try. And so the final question is, could we survive on mushrooms alone. If we'd said that of adequate nutrition. And we could. And the problem is we would have to eat about 12 to 14 pounds a day, uh, which would mean that we would spend the entire day grazing a large sheep of cattle. So in summary, in my approach to the subject, which is being discussed. We didn't attempt to be like the lady's hoop skirt, which covers the subject and doesn't touch it, but more like the dance with G string, which touches the subject. Which doesn't touch it. So I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to go to the, uh, the chat to see the questions. Um, 
yeah, does anybody have any questions? I guess maybe now, um, if anybody wanted to ask a question, you could like raise your hand uh, and, and we could uh, get you to unmute. I have a quick question. Um, I saw recently um, there was an article and it may have just been something kind of clickbaity, but um, it was about, and, and I've actually been doing this with some of the ways I cook mushrooms, but um, there was an article that came out and it was framed like, top chefs have been saying that we've been preparing mushrooms the wrong way. You're supposed to get them wet first um, so that you, you know, as you sort of like, you know, sweat, sweat them, it brings out like the flavor and then once all of the water is sort of cooked out, you add your uh, fat content, like butter, oil, and that gets the most flavor. And I don't know if it's based on a study or if it's just like anecdotal chefs said this is the best. But um, I had read it on another blog like several years ago and I had been doing that just because it like also uh, prevents like the mushrooms from soaking up all of the fat like you sort of sweat all the water out first and then you add fat and it doesn't absorb all the fat. And I don't know if that affects the flavor too, but I don't know if that anybody or uh, Dennis had an opinion on that technique. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen those. Um, you know, it's, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> it's actually not a bad idea. Um, what I, it, and in a way I've been doing that for a long time by when I start cooking the mushrooms, I'll cover them, and then all the liquid comes out, and they basically braise in their own liquid. Mm -hmm. And then we evaporate that all the way, uh, then add some fat and let them caramelize. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a, 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 some, just a different way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that those, I think they're absolutely right that. Uh, that you need to cook them really well and to get, if you get rid of all the, all the liquid, <clears throat> the, the flavor concentration is very much higher. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I learned that mistake a, a few years ago. I, you know, we didn't get uh, any of the woods, my Taki in Washington. And when I moved to Texas, a friend of mine in Washington, DC, sent me a fresh maitake. I was really excited. And I cooked that mushroom and I thought, what, these folks in the East Coast, they're crazy. This is hardly worth eating. It was insipid, it was bland, it was awful. And I posted some snarky comment about mm -hmm. it on, on Fingerfoot, the fungi Facebook page, and Tom Volk, who many of you probably know. He, posted, mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, Dennis, you cooked it wrong. He said, mm -hmm. you should cook it until it is really dark and caramelized, which I did. And the difference was, it was stunning. I was so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I made this comment that I, because I thought I knew how to cook one mushrooms at that point. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that I had probably been undercooking them most of my life. But now I, I really cook. I recently um, had some oyster mushrooms that I cooked in the oven just with some like olive oil, but I made sure they were really done, like you said, and they got nice and brown and really crispy and they were really, really delicious. Just like a little olive oil, a little bit of salt. Um, and yeah, it just turned out really, really well. Yeah, cook well, salt and acid and fat, and you're not gonna go far wrong. Um, now, <clears throat> you, I, I did, uh, you, you will be getting a, a list of um, recommended reading from me uh, as, as an email. And I've listed a, a, a small number of cookbooks, uh, mushroom cookbooks. At one point, I had a collection of over 50. I've got rid of about 45 of them. They are terrible. Um, most of them are just not worth having. Um, there, there are a couple of new ones uh, that 
stuff that I do recommend. Uh, but many of them do nothing more than add mushrooms to other standard dishes. And they don't enhance those dishes, and they really don't enhance the flavor of the mushroom. Over the years, I have found that our mushroom cookery has really become simpler and simpler in order to just get the flavor of the mushrooms. And as I, as I said, um, to me, nothing is better than fresh morels uh, put on a grill with butter, salt, and lemon juice. Mm -hmm. there's, there's almost no way you can improve that. Mm -hmm. I, I introduced that when I was with uh, Britt Bunyan at his annual morel foray up in Wisconsin a couple of years ago with people that have been picking morels in the Midwest for years. And and they were doing, you know, what you sort of do in the mid Midwest. You, you put them in batter and you fry them. <laughs> nice. And I stuck these on the grill and everyone said, oh, Benjamin's been crazy. This is not the way you eat morels. And uh, I think that weekend I made 20 converts into, into grilling mushrooms. Uh, the first time I had grilled mushrooms was at the Telluride Mushroom Festival, speaking of Britt Bunyard. Um, and that really blew me away because they really do pick up that smoky flavor of the meat really, or not the meat, the wood really well. Um, and it, and I guess I didn't know, know quite how they prepared them. Maybe they like cooked it alongside bacon, but these oyster mushrooms really had like this really meaty flavor. Um, another experience, like you brought up chicken in the woods, not tasting like chicken. Um, I, I agree with that totally. One thing I've noticed though, that it does have more of a similar texture. Uh, like it, if you cook it right, it kind of can get that stringy texture that chicken can have sometimes, but definitely not the flavor. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, 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 to, to, be, to be honest, I'm not a, I, I've only had it a few times because we didn't eat it on the West Coast. Mm. So my exposure to it is relatively limited. And I certainly haven't had it well cooked by anybody who knew what they were doing. Uh, so I shouldn't just it too badly. <laughs> <laughs> you have a um, coconut chicken of the woods. I made that recently, sort of like coconut shrimp and did it like fried. And I think it tastes better than chicken, like that sul sulfur kind of flavor kind of has its own kind of like a acid sort of flavor as well like um, yeah. but it's just perfectly harvested at the right time it's not too dry just still juicy it's just great and then fried of course like anything <laughs> that's um, a lot of flavor i have a question about like acids i like you're talking about like lime juice and and vinegars and stuff do you have any that you would recommend over others or stuff that uh, like as far as like avoiding for flavor or just kind of play around with it? No, I, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, uh, I think it's well established that acid, especially at the end of cooking, um, and you know, that's why you'll see so many recipes add a squeeze of lemon or a squeeze of lime. Um, I, I like using rice vinegar, which is very mild. And, you know, I'm not getting a citrus flavor unless I want it. Um, but I pretty much add a little acid to almost every dish that I, that I prepare. <clears throat> There's an excellent, I think, Net, I think she's on Netflix. I, uh, it, she's a, even Indian chef who did a series called Salt, Acid, Fat, and Heat. And each segment focuses on the four key elements of cooking. The importance of heat, the importance of salt, the importance of acid. Okay. And that, that's definitely worth watching. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I will def yeah, I'll check it out. I think uh, one of our other friends had suggested it a while back and kind of just let it slip to the wayside. But yeah, I think I'll make a point to go back to that. So we do have a question from the chat here. Uh, the question is, is there a suggested way to prep or process wild mushrooms to get rid of the insects that may be in them? Or is it generally the consensus that uh, a mushroom with insects 
in it is too far gone? Oh, that's a great, great question. Um, <clears throat> and it, <clears throat> it largely depends on how squeamish you are. <laughs> so, I, you know, a little bit of extra added protein doesn't bother me at all. Um, now, there's some, uh, obviously, there are some mushrooms where the insect concentration can be so high uh, that they are too far gone. And the, the ones I'm most familiar with are, are bow leaves. Um, however, we would take those and dry them, and the insects drop out to the bottom of the dehydrator. Uh, and you know the mushrooms don't look pretty because they've got insect tracks all over them. But they can be turned into porcini powder, uh, they can be rehydrated and, and they just fine. Um, I certainly, you know, wouldn't eat a mushroom that started crawling away from you. <laughs> but I wouldn't, you know, it, <clears throat> the uh, many of many mushrooms are the food source for some for huge numbers. Everything from tiny things which you hardly notice, like springtails, which people swarm over certain, uh, for example, ammonitis. There's some flies that rely on ammonitis for their breeding. Uh, there's a very close association between insects and a fungi called spore dispersal. Uh, so it's, it, you know, I, I don't let small numbers of insects bother me at all. I mean, they're going to get cooked and you're never going to see them again. So it's up to your discretion. Cool. Um, another question is, have you eaten a mushroom that the book says do not eat? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Trying to no, no. I'm I'm fairly conservative in my. Uh, in my, there was a period I was very experimental, but I never intentionally ate something that I was told uh, was toxic. I think my biggest disappointment were burpers, uh, because I learned very early on in Washington State. That 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 so-called burpers or early morels were problematic, and and they're always the first mushroom to come up in spring, and so we would go on these great burp hunts and we'd come home and I look at them and say, you know, I'm told that these may cause problems, and so for years and years uh, they landed up in our compost pile, uh, and then. Years later, I moved to uh, Eastern Washington and uh, discovered all the locals had been eating burpers for years and years and years. And they said they're fine. And so we started eating them, and they spectacular. In fact, I prefer them in the world. Um, so I'd, I'd wasted probably 30 years throwing burpers away because I was concerned about them. And that concern actually came from a single statement by Alexander Smith, the great mycologist, who said that he became what I think nauseous or dizzy following a meal of burpers. And that one statement got translated into every field garden for the next 50 years. Uh, and this is one of the problems with determining both poison and edibility, is they're based on single opinions without any sort of systematic investigation. And certainly when an expert says, you know, I have trouble eating this mushroom, you have to take it seriously. Uh, but then if you look at whole populations, people have been eating burpers in Europe for years and years without any trouble whatsoever. Now that isn't to say that sooner or later there's going to be somebody who has a bad reaction to burpers. 
but that's no different than you will have a bad reaction to a strawberry or any other kind of food based on your own personal physiology. Right. So this kind of gets to a question that someone asked uh, that kind of leads into it, but like, and so I'm going to kind of, they're asking like the best way to, how, what would be the best way to determine edibility? And I think my answer for, that I've gathered from your presentation would be to uh, um, be engaged in the culture of mushroom hunting and looking for them and interacting with people that do it regularly to kind of uh, understand and to practice identifying mushrooms and having those conversations with other people that do eat mushrooms. Would you, would that be the best way to determine? Yeah, and, and, and my recommendation is uh, when, when you start eating, eat a small amount initially of a single species. So when, you know, if you find something edible, have a small helping and see how you do. If you have no bad reaction, uh, that, you know, that's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, and I was going to bring up too that um, there's a really great group on Facebook um, called the Texas Mushroom Identification. And there's a lot of experts um, from this region and also, you know, people that have spent a lot of time in Texas that are happy to help identify mushrooms. And so uh, it's a great resource and you can get answers within a couple of hours a lot of times. Sometimes during mushroom season, it gets really busy and you have to wait, but it's a great resource if you don't know someone personally within your friend family network. It's a way to connect with people that are experts. And so that's one of the places that's helped me personally, like learn, um, learn, learn mushrooms and their identification. Is, that's not the North Texas mushroom, that's Texas. Uh, that's the general one. I think it was started by Alan Rockefeller. It's oh yeah. It's, um, but there is a North Texas as well for people that are maybe in North Texas. But I think Texas mushroom ID, it's just general all Texas, and it's specific for identification, um, uh, nothing else. Like, you know, people don't post sort of their, their selfies with mushrooms and stuff like that. It's just if you need an identification. A little more disciplined. Um, mm -hmm. That sounds good. Uh, okay, uh, another question that we have is about mushroom preservation. Uh, can mushrooms be sliced and frozen in the raw state? Absolutely. Um, in, actually, what we used to do with matsutake is just take the small matsutake, wrap them in foil, and freeze them um, without, without any cooking whatsoever. And as long as you keep, you know, use them within a reasonable amount of time, two to six months, uh, they were absolutely fine. So there's so much of, now, there's no question that uh, cooking them, either sauteing them or far boiling them, uh, that inactivates the number of enzymes and they're going to probably last a little bit longer in the freezer. Uh, I mean, we would keep frozen mushrooms <clears throat> like that for up to two years. Oh, wow. Awesome. And, That's know, great. When they were reconstituted, they were just fine. Cool. Uh, um, so, uh, but, uh, but the one thing to be very careful of <clears throat> when you are storing dried mushrooms make sure that you store them in glass with a airtight gasket so that insects can't get in. Because even if you think that you have completely dehydrated your morels or your porcini, if there's any moisture left in there, I lost something like 10 plastic bags of morels. Oh no. Early on when a moth got into our pantry and turned them into morel dust. <laughs> so I learned that lesson. And the other way to, uh, if you want to keep them longer, is uh, after you have them in glass, is put them in your freezer for two to three days. And that will kill anything else that's left in there. And that's actually the standard technique that we use in herbaria. In herbaria, we freeze everything uh, before it comes into the herbaria to make sure that we get rid of um, uh, anything they could get into the plant material. So, good to know, yeah. You know, doubly safe. 
Um, so this here, uh, this question says, at the end of Musings of a Mushroom Hunter, you lamented leaving the mushroom paradise of the Pacific Northwest for Texas. Has Texas provided you any mushroom love in the years since? Oh, that's a great question. I actually dropped out of my college for 10 years when I moved to Texas. Um, just because there was so, you know, compared to the Pacific Northwest, it felt like a, a micro desert. Um, but I, you know, subsequently got back into it, and the mycology of this area is, in many respects, more diverse, it's more fascinating, it's more interesting. Uh, unfortunately, it just lacks the number of edibles and edible mushrooms that you have in the US. And so I went from a stage where all I focused on was eating mushrooms, you know, foraging and eating, to now I'm much more interested in the biology, the taxonomy, the science, the ecology, uh, what mushrooms are doing in our, our environment. So it's completely changed my focus being in Texas. I, I no longer look I don't even worry about edible mushrooms. Um, I will admit that this year I found my first Texas morale. Oh, awesome! Yay! Yeah, I thought I thought I, I was excited. I was excited because I didn't even know that they lived down there. But but the mycology of Texas is really it's, it's worth focusing on. And, and especially if you go to East Texas or, or down in the big thicket, uh, where the mycology is truly amazing, you know, like more Gulf Coast. And I would recommend for, for people in the area to consider becoming members of the Gulf States Mycologic Society. You know, they have annual forays down the south as well as Mississippi and Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, and you get to see a wide variety of different cultures. North Texas is a very hard environment. Um, I think you in Central Texas and the Hill Country have a lot more opportunity. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a lot of, to do with the precipitation amount as you get farther into the continent and stuff. Um, so East Texas and the Big Thicket area is definitely kind of our uh, the the unrecognized gem, I think. And just kind of the whole uh, southeastern United States is kind of like this uh, underappreciated mycological uh, resource. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's also extremely poorly studied. Yes, totally. And I think like like you were talking about earlier with the, um, with all the, uh, how we kind of mischaracterize species from the United States uh, as the European species, and we give them the names because they are the same uh, on the on the surface level. They just look the same to us, but uh, the obviously the genetics are uh, separated by it. millennia and uh, and oceans. So there's not the, that ability to cross over like they would have. Um, it's really important. I think <clears throat> most people now recognize that. <coughs> You should really use field guides that uh, are specific to your local area. And unfortunately, you know, we've only got really two guides for Texas. Uh, one is Texas Mushrooms, which is a little old. And then the, the new one by uh, the sets and, and Dave Lewis on Mushrooms to the Gulf Coast, mm -hmm. which it's a great book, but it really doesn't cover the center or even North Texas. It really focuses more on the coastal mushrooms. So there will be lots and lots of things that you're going to stumble across that you are never going to be able to find in the Right. Yeah, that, I, I know that's kind of one of the goals, long, you know, one of the long-term goals of this group is to kind of bring that advocacy to Central Texas and to kind of help bring some of that clarity to and some of that missing data uh, in the overall record um, to kind of because uh, 
you know, like you say, there's so much left to be learned and so much more clarity to be had about even just understanding what is generally safe and what is, you know, an abnormal allergic reaction that some biologist had a hundred years ago that got copy and pasted <laughs> into field guys ever since. So one of the things we would be interested in is we're <clears throat> increasing the herbarium collection of fungi at the Botanic Research Institute. So if uh, people are interested in sending us samples for preservation, what I can do is send you uh, collecting techniques and you know, what we would require uh, yeah. so we can get the both positively identified, get the genetics done, and, uh, and have them stored. I, I know the University of Texas uh, stores some um, as does. Um, oh, yeah, like College Station. Uh, no, Texas A&M. Yeah, A&M uh, also has uh, uh, a, you know, a, a fairly decent uh, uh, collection. <clears throat> but the more we can accumulate the data from Texas, uh, because they have, there has not been a lot of professional mycology ever been done in the state. So we do not have great records. And <clears throat> every month we are seeing fungi that people said never been reported from Texas before. And then we discovered they're much more widespread than we have imagined. Right. You know, the, the classic is the one and, and I love the fact that you guys are using it as, as part of your logo. And that's Coriactus Giastra. Um, you know, Texas Star? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we, we launched an effort a number of years ago to see if we could not get that uh, designated as the Texas, uh, uh, the Texas fungus. You know, we have some people who would like to work on that too. So I think we're starting to build a, uh, a broad statewide coalition of people we can apply pressure to uh, politicians to get this, make this happen. And, and you know, now with things like our naturalists, you know, we've recognized sightings from south of San Antonio all the way to the Red River in this broad band that runs up through uh, central Texas. Uh, and that's, you know, in a very short period of time, the number of identifications has just grown dramatically. So it's really up to you guys that are out in the field, looking and collecting, to make sure that you, uh, uh, you know, document those collections so that we get a better understanding of them. Yeah. And then, I mean, the best part is you're all guinea pigs. I know that you haven't volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Do you use, um? Um, is iNaturalist the best place for a citizen, uh, an amateur mycologist to, to log their observations? I know it's the most user-friendly. Um, is that what you prefer? No, no. I, I wish it was because it is so easy to use. Unfortunately, uh, the quality of identification for fungi and my iNaturalist is terrible. And so most people are using a mushroom observer. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, and you know, I, I, in many respects, it would be nice to use both. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're going to get much better help from either dedicated amateurs or professionals on mushroom observer. Um, then you are going to be on iNaturalist. Um, I've, I've looked at the identifications on iNaturalist and I would say conservatively 50% are completely wrong and 10% are horrendously wrong. I mean, even to the point of being potentially dangerous. Um, so, that makes it a little bit more problematic, uh, but if you, but if you ask for help on <clears throat> mushroom observer, you're much more likely uh, to get. Uh, 
Uh, I have a question about the uh, the Texas Star. What have you ever tried to eat that one? Do you know the edibility on that one, or not a clue? I mean, I've, we've got some great collections up there uh, that we go and visit every year, make sure they're doing well. Um, I mean, about three years ago, we probably in one collection had fifty specimens. Oh wow! But, uh, no, never tried that. I'm not that adventurous. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to you guys. We've had people ask us before, so I figured I'd ask. Yeah. Um, okay, well, yeah, we've been going for almost two hours. Does anybody else have any more questions? Grasses tasted like cauliflower. That's what somebody said. I've never tried it, so. It's, it's a nice mushroom. It's crisp and crispy, but nothing to me other than cauliflower tastes like cauliflower. <laughs> I, I think that's sometimes the interesting thing about taste and some of and our senses in general is like the experience is ineffable sometimes and so we try and make these associations with things that are really familiar um and and so like that can manifest itself in ways that like are I don't know, controversial if you will yeah and and that's that's known as i mean people use it all the time the, the uh, in terms of expectation. If you expect something to taste like something, um, it almost inevitably will. Um, and chefs use it and the way foods uh, <laughs> present it. And, and, and even described. And once you've got that description in your head, it's very easy to, uh, to, to honestly believe that's in fact uh, what it is. Right. Okay, do we have any more questions from anybody? Just looking to see. If, uh, Okay, well, I think if we don't have any more questions, I'd like to remind anyone who hasn't already to sign up for our newsletter so you can find out about uh, more, um, more of these in the future. Um, and yeah, Dennis, will, uh, we will share that email with everybody so everyone can get the, the PDF and, and uh, the link of the list of resources and, and uh, books that you recommend. And, we really, really appreciate you giving us your time. Yeah, I'm, and I'm sorry for the, the poor sound at the beginning. I, I hope everybody eventually was able to, to hear me. Uh, yeah, I think it was just a little quiet, and uh, once you got a little bit closer, uh, it, was, it was spot on, no problems. Okay, good. Well, hopefully one of these days I'll get down there and we can actually meet everybody in person yeah yeah and i and uh we will definitely be once we can once we're able we'll be organizing some you know in-person meetups and hopefully we'll be able to apply some of these things that we talked about today in the real world and if anybody has interesting experiences um both positive and negative uh, let me know because i like to keep track of them um, yeah just real quick i'm gonna after uh, last year on July 4th, I found a lobster mushroom in Central Texas. And I think after I, uh, after all of this rain, I'm gonna go back, because it was on July 4th, and I'm gonna go back to the same spot to see if it, it's come back. But I don't know if it will, because last year we had two 100 year floods, so. Yeah. That's that's the only that's one of the more anomalous of sort of finds that I've seen in Texas. And, and just to tell you how <coughs> tell you how, uh, how difficult Texas is. When we first moved to Texas, we had a place out towards the Lido on the Clear Fork of the Thirty. And we one year had a lot of spring rains. I was walking my dogs down to the river bottom, and the entire river bottom fruited with chanterelles. 
We mm. catch cows for like three weeks. Wow. Our neighbors have never seen them. Mm -hmm. um, I've been back there 12 times uh, and we've never seen them again. So we know that the mycelium is there. We know that the mushroom is there. But it just requires the absolute perfect condition. Right. For them, for, for them. And even since we've sold the property, the owners uh, are past them. If you ever see a golden yellow mushroom down there, you'll look at the mother on the, on the, on the hand. And this is the challenge with uh, foraging, especially up there. Yeah, sort of feast or famine. That's what yeah. they say in Texas. So if you do get that um, lobster mushroom, please add it to a fried egg and tell me what you think. It's spectacular. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was so good. It was the first time I had it when I found it last year. I loved it. And you, you know, for 30 years up in the Northwest, that was a trash mushroom. Nobody picked it. Wow. Everywhere. And you sort of squished them and squashed them and, you know, went after the chanterelles and the matsutake and the bolis. Uh, and then lots of mushrooms just became trendy. And uh, that's also a very interesting phenomenon, uh, certain products become popular for a, for a time. Mm -hmm. well, one thing I would counsel people against is buying <clears throat> wild mushrooms in supermarkets. I was down in our high-end market recently and they had collections of morels that were covered in mold that were half rotten, $60 a pound. Yeah. People, unfortunately, don't know better on buying them. So, go and pick them yourselves and enjoy them that way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Dennis, for, for imparting us with your knowledge and many years of experience. It's been a very, very, uh, been a, my pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Take care.